Everybody, and welcome to the Bible study series from the Gospel Minute. Tonight we're in part three of the study of St. Mark's Gospel. If you missed part one and two, you can find them on St. Michael's Orthodox Church YouTube channel, and I'll provide a link to that in the description section. <clears throat> if you have any questions or comments about what we have covered in parts one and two, please post them now and I'll try and answer your questions or comments a little later. And remember this, this is a live program and your participation is important, so don't keep your questions or comments to yourselves. Now let's start with a prayer for understanding and inspiration. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. O Lord, we ask that you enlighten our hearts and minds, that we may learn and understand your teachings and apply them to our lives. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. And now on to St. Mark. Last week we covered our Lord's time in the wilderness after his baptism, the start of his ministry in Capernaum, his first miracle is recorded by St. Mark, and the theme of forgiveness. We also discuss the authority by which Christ healed, drove out demons, and forgave sins. And we're going to talk more about his authority tonight as we finish chapter 2 and start chapter 3 of Mark's Gospel. In chapter 2 we have already seen that Jesus demonstrated to us his authority over demons, especially in his first miracle, according to St. Mark, which took place in the synagogue in Capernaum. We saw his authority, or his power, over physical sickness when he healed Simon's, Peter's mother-in-law, and healed the leper and paralytic. Through these physical healings, Mark is leading us down the path toward our Lord's forgiveness of sin. And tonight, St. Mark relates to us our Lord's authority over the fast and the Sabbath, and a new interpretation of the law. Now, when I mention the word law tonight, it'll be the religious law of the Jews. Okay, let's read from St. Mark, chapter 2, verses 18 through 22. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting, and people came and said to him, Why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. No one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts new wine into old wineskins. If he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is lost and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh skins. Previously, Jesus came into conflict with the scribes, and we remember who they were. The scribes were trained interpreters and teachers of the Jewish law, and they were mostly of the Pharisee sect. Well, in tonight's readings, Jesus comes squarely into conflict with the Pharisees themselves. The Pharisees, as I mentioned before, were a Jewish sect. They were strict interpreters of the Torah, that is, the Jewish law as found in the first five books of the Old Testament. And they insisted everyone must follow the law to the letter. But through what they believed to be loopholes in the law, they managed to avoid following much of the law. Jesus would later call them hypocrites. They did not practice what they preached. Observant Jews fasted twice a week, on Mondays and Thursdays. On those days, they ate nothing until the evening. This is mentioned in chapter 8 of the Didache. The Didache 
is a first or very early second century Christian document that gives the teachings of the apostles. I suggest you all get a copy of it and read it, and you can find it on Amazon. I'll provide a link to it in the description area. Okay, going on. It looks like that the meal at Levi's house, you remember that from last week, that we mentioned took place on one of the fast days. And Jesus and his disciples were ignoring the Jewish law of fasting. The Pharisees challenged Jesus on this, saying, Why is everyone else observing the fast, but your disciples are not? You see, there was no flexibility in the law. The law was the law and must be followed, no matter what the circumstances. Now let's not forget that Jesus was himself an observant Jew and so followed the laws on fasting. In fact, he assumed and he mandated that his disciples follow it. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verses 16 through 18, And when you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, and he's speaking of the Pharisees, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fa fasting may not be seen by men, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. But in Jesus' view, inflexible rules must give way to love and human need. In this case, love for Levi and his friends, whom Jesus was trying to bring into the kingdom of God. The old way, the law of the Pharisees said, the letter of the law is everything. There are no exceptions. But the new way of Christ was love is everything. There must be room for exception to rules. Jesus replied to the Pharisees' challenge by using the analogy of a wedding feast. In those days, a wedding feast would go on for seven days. And obviously, some of those days would be on fast days. Now, the sons of the bridal chamber, that's a term for wedding guests, would not fast while the bridegroom was with them, and the groom was present during the whole feast. Not to partake of the feast would be an insult to the bridegroom and his bride. If this is the norm for a mere human groom, how much more for the Son of Man? At a wedding party, they must share the bridegroom's joy, even if it meant suspending their usual fasting. If they were willing to suspend the fasting rules for a mere wedding, there could be no doubt that the fasting rules would be suspended for Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But as our Lord says in, chapter, in verse 20, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away, and then they will fast in that day. And then they will fast in that day. He is, of course, predicting his own death. And the time for rejoicing because of his presence would come to an end. Then that would be a time for fasting. What we have here is the old way coming into conflict with a new way. And there's a very important point to be made here, though. The new way is the fulfillment of the old way. Remember, Jesus did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill it and to renew it, to bring fresh life into it. That is, to bring the law forward into its fullness. And also remember, the two great commandments that the Lord gave us. The first, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second of these commandments was to love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, well, these two commandments are actually part of the old law and can be found in the Torah, in the books of Leviticus and Deuteronomy. And they are the thread that both the old and the new law hang. But the strictness of the interpretation of the old law must go and cannot stand with the new. Keeping this in mind, our Lord goes on to explain that the new interpretation of the law is like a patch of new cloth 
that is used to repair an old garment, let's say an old shirt. The old shirt has been washed several times and has shrunk, and it will not shrink anymore. The patch of new cloth has not been washed, and thus has not yet shrunk. When the patch of the new cloth is sewn into the old shirt, it shrinks, but the old shirt doesn't. The shrinking of the new cloth causes the patch to tear away from its seams and thus away from the old shirt. In short, mixing the old with the new just won't work. But Jesus is not satisfied with one anal analogy, and some people call these parables. He gives us one more example using wineskins and new wine for his analogy. Now let me tell you about old wineskins and new wine. Wineskins were, and still are in some places, used to store wine in. After the wine has been in the skins for a while, the skin becomes like hardened leather, and there is no give in it, no stretches left in it. I lived in Germany for a, a number of years, and in the fall of the year we would go out and buy the new wine from that year's grape harvest. But in many cases, the new wine hadn't finished the fermentation process. Now, when wine ferments, it produces gas, and the gas is given off into the air, and everything is fine. But, if it is bottled before the fermentation is finished, the extra gas that is produced pops the cork off the bottle. In the case of the wine skins, no one puts new wine into the old wine skins. Remember, the old wine skins no longer have any stretch or fl flexibility in them. But the new wine is still expanding and will tear the old wineskins apart. But new wineskins will be flexible and will stretch to accommodate the new wine. Again, the old and the new won't work together. The old shows no flexibility while the new must be flexible. And all this started with our Lord's authority over the fast. But we seem to have gone much further. Jesus and Mark have brought us into the deeper waters comparing the incompatibility of the old and flexible system with a new kingdom of God, which love and consideration of mankind demands a certain amount of flexibility. All righty. Now, our Lord and the Pharisees came into conflict over the issue of the Sabbath. And let's read from chapter 2, verse 23 through 28. Before I do that, though, let me check for any comments or questions that we might have. And... Yeah, yeah, let's turn that off. Okay. Well, hello, Sherry. Nice to see you. All righty. Now let's read chapter 2, verses 23 through 28. Hello, Sherry. And I thought I'd turn that off. All righty. Okay, one Sabbath, he was going through the grain fields, and as they made their way, his disciples began to pluck ears of grain. And the Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him? How he entered the house of God when Abathar was high priest, and ate the bread of presence which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Jesus and his disciples were going through the grain fields. And as they went, his disciples picked the heads of grain, rubbing them in their palms, 
and blowing away the chaff in order to eat the grain remaining in their hands. It was sort of like a, a granola treat or a can granola bar to satisfy their immediate hunger. And actually, this was allowed in the Jewish law, which permitted a traveler to eat such food. See Deuteronomy 23 and 25. The Pharisees, with their detailed elaboration of the basic law, forbidding work on the Sabbath, could only see violations of the law and sin. As far as they were concerned, by plucking the heads of grain, the disciples were harvesting grain. By rubbing them in their hands, they were threshing the grain. By blowing the chaff away, they were winnowing the grain. Now, it is true that God had forbidden, forbidden work on the Sabbath, but the Pharisees had defined work in such a way that emptied the law of all common sense. By their man-made tradition of defining what work was, they had made the law almost useless. The Pharisees had failed to see the work that Jesus and his disciples were engaged in. All they could see was that the law had been broken. The law that they had defined in their own narrow way. So in their self-righteousness demanded of Jesus why he permitted his disciples to do what was not permitted on the Sabbath. And Jesus replied by referring to the scriptures. The example of the scriptures proved that men might do what was not technically permitted in order to meet human need. In the passage about the high priest Abathar, David and his men were hungry as they fled from Saul. See 1 Samuel chapter 21. Oh, by the way, in that you'll read that it was actually, a, I can't remember his name now, I'm sorry. But it, was, it wasn't actually Abathar, it was during the priesthood of Abathar, though. They had no choice but to eat the bread of the presence. The bread of the presence was Twelve loaves of bread that were set out in the holy place and were only to be eaten by the priests. Leviticus 24, 9. These men, though, were genuinely in need of food. So the law had to give way to human need. And Jesus claimed that he and his disciples faced the same circumstances that confronted David and his men. Jesus was saying that the law needed flexibility. Flexibility that did not exist under the narrow and uncompromising definitions, the Pharisees. The Pharisees were more concerned about honoring the Sabbath than they were for the needs of man. Jesus had to tell them in verse 27, 27 the Sabbath was made for man, not man made for the Sabbath. That is, the Sabbath was made for the benefit of man. Man would benefit by having a day of rest from his work and have the chance to worship God. The Pharisees evidently believed that man was created to observe the Sabbath, that man was a slave to the Sabbath. Then Jesus goes on to say in verse 28, So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. I'll read it again. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And there it is. Jesus declares himself to be the Lord of the Sabbath. He has authority over the Sabbath. Jesus in chapter 2 of Mark's Gospel had asserted his authority, authority over demons, physical illness, spiritual sickness, forgiveness of sin, the fast, and now the Sabbath. He has, in fact, established his authority over the law of the Jews and disregarded the narrow and ridiculous definitions of the law held by the Pharisees. <clears throat> Going on into chapter 3, Jesus once again comes into conflict with the Pharisees over the Sabbath, this time in their synagogue, and it, it probably took place in Capernaum. And this time it is Jesus who takes the initiative. Let's read the text together. Again he entered the synagogue, and a man was there who had a withered hand. And they watched him to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, 
Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. And the Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how they might destroy him. Now Jesus enters the synagogue and finds a man with a weathered hand. Everyone is watching to see if Jesus will heal the man's hand. This is the Sabbath, and according to the Pharisees, a healing in the Sabbath would not be lawful. They were watching and waiting for the chance to accuse Jesus. Once again, Jesus sees his chance to assert his authority over the Sabbath and the law. Jesus calls to the man to come into the middle of the synagogue. Then Jesus challenges the Pharisees by saying, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? The Pharisees had nothing to say. Jesus was angered and saddened at these hard-hearted Pharisees. They cared nothing for the man. They cared only for their overly strict interpretation of the law. As we saw in the text, Jesus restores the man's withered hand. The Pharisees were incensed at this, and when they left the synagogue, they immediately went to the Herodians to plot against Jesus. We know who the Pharisees were, but we haven't met the Herodians yet. The Herodians were the followers of Herod the Tetrarch. Herod was the puppet ruler of the Jews who was set up in power by the Romans. The Herodians cared little for the Jewish religious law. Their only care was to maintain the peace. As long as things were peaceful, the Romans would keep them in power. And they saw Jesus as a threat to that peace. The Pharisees and the Herodians did not get along and normally would not associate between themselves. But both seeing Jesus as a threat, would, that would bring them together to conspire against Jesus. As Father Farley says in his commentary, the shadow of the cross had fallen early across the path of Jesus. Well, friends, that's as far as we're going to go tonight. We have seen in chapter 2 and the first few verses in chapter 3, Jesus asserting his authority over the law and his interpretation of the law was to be far different from that of the Pharisees. The narrowness and inflexibility of the interpretation of the law that was put forth by the Pharisees had to come to an end. In the view of Jesus, the law had to be interpreted with love and consideration of man. It must show more flexibility. Well, I hope you enjoyed tonight's program, and I'll be back here again next week as we go on with the Gospel of St. Mark. Good night, and may God bless us all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.